<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Eggs. Today's special guest is co-founder of True Six and PR manager at Desk Time, Julia Gifford. Julia is a Canadian-born tech enthusiast, writer, and entrepreneur focused on helping small brands succeed through content marketing, social media marketing, public relations, and more. Julia's expertise has helped her many clients and her own business achieve broad exposure to ever larger audiences. She does this by leveraging data you may not even know you have, spinning it into compelling stories designed to enhance engagement across all channels of communication, from social media to mass market publications like Forbes, Fast Company, and Inc. Magazine, to name a few. Julia joins us today for an exciting conversation about getting media coverage even when you don't think you have anything newsworthy to say, how to amplify your business through content marketing, how public relations can take your organization to the next level, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, Julia Gifford. Hey, Julia, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So uh, thanks so much for doing this. I have to ask, I saw on your LinkedIn profile that you were in Latvia. Are you actually calling in from Latvia today? I am. And it's 1030 at night over here. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you yeah. so much for uh, staying up late for us. I appreciate it. Yeah. Cool. So um, why don't you kind of start at the beginning? Tell us uh, how you got to where you're at now, uh, what you do, uh, what True Six is. And yeah, go from there. So my starting career is a pretty considerably typical one. Uh, You know, I was in um, college and as a student, I needed to support myself. So I found a part time job, uh, which happened to be at this startup conglomerate. Uh, It's this uh, big company that just turns out um, company after company. Uh, It's called the Draugiem Group, uh, based in Latvia. And it was uh, great timing. They were starting to, they had already created products that had totally taken over the Latvian market, and they were starting to reach out into the international market. So they needed an English speaker, and I was there. And uh, so as I graduated, my Uh, bachelor's program that part-time job turned into a full-time job and and the the startups that we started to build continued to grow and uh, one of them uh, called Printful is now Latvia's first unicorn and another one of them is Desktime which is a startup that we started working on uh, almost immediately after I joined and I'm still working on it uh, to this day even though uh, I don't work at that company anymore I have since uh, started my own company with a uh, co-founder and uh, we loved working together with desk time so much that they remained our clients uh, even as we left the group and so we've really been with them since day one and and it's been a really wild ride and we have had so much flexibility to do whatever we want and uh, have made some very interesting moves to get some pretty insane viral publicity. Uh, And that's really what I wanna talk about today and hopefully uh, help other entrepreneurs realize the potential for publicity even when you think that there might not be any. Yeah, I love that. And it's awesome too that you mentioned Printful. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, while you were talking, I was thinking, oh, you know, we talked to a lot of, you know, Latvian startups and tech companies and things like that. You know, obviously, this is a hotbed for that type of thing. But we actually had head of marketing for Printful write us Purins on our show. Uh, I don't know. It's been some time ago, back in March 2020. But um, but I'm also a customer of, of uh, Printful. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a pretty fun connection to make. So yeah, for sure. I guess then let's get into that a little bit and talk about how that works. So I think there's a lot of people who really do want more media coverage, or at least think they want it. But I, I think very few people actually know where to get it. So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how we could get started looking for more media coverage, and what to talk about when it feels like we don't have anything to say? For sure. And this is one of the things that we struggled with early on uh, before we had any any experience with this. And our experience came from the ground up just by trying and doing and experimenting. And uh, we found that we didn't necessarily have anything newsworthy. Other startups were getting media coverage with major multi-million dollar funding rounds, but we were bootstrapped. We didn't need funding rounds. Uh, We had already found our own profit, uh, which is arguably even better, but you know, that's a topic for a different uh, (laughs) conversation. Um, 
And, uh, and yeah, so we didn't have anything like major happening. It was just software that was doing well and it was serving its uh, users. And so we were starting to think about what it is that we can work with to, to get that visibility because this is particularly true for companies that are outside of their core market. So European companies, for example, that want to uh, sell products to an American market, which is one of the biggest markets in the world, it's really difficult to, to get that visibility. And one of those ways to get it, uh, get, get in front of these eyeballs from across the ocean is through media visibility. So what we sat down and thought about was uh, that we are in fact sitting on a treasure trove of user behavior data. So desk time in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a productivity app. It, people install it on their computers and it tracks how you spend your time at the computer so that afterwards you can analyze how you spent your day and how you can improve in the future. So it's, it's kind of for like a productivity hacking type of person. And so we have these hundreds of thousands of users all over the world tracking how they use their computer. And uh, so we realize that this is uh, a sociologist's dream. They have all of this data stored. And, and uh, so what we decided is, uh, are there different angles and different data sets that we can pull out that can inform us about some kind of user behavior that is interesting uh, to, a wider, to the wider public? And uh, it started out like really lowbrow. So we had, this was at the time when standing desks were like all the rage. Uh, anyone, any office that was a cool office started implementing standing desks and there were claims that they're better, better for productivity, better for health, but no one really had any data to back it up. And at that time, our office, which was a super styling office, we also got uh, a few standing tables. So we implemented this experiment that using desk time, the productivity software, we would spend time working at the standing table. And then uh, using, using that data, we were able to compare it to, for example, a week where we weren't using uh, the standing desk and then see if our productivity had increased or decreased. So that way- So, so what's the answer? Because I just bought one and I wanna know if I'm gonna more work done. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be happy with the answer. The answer was right. it depends. <laughs> but, uh, but, but the result was though, that we were the only ones that had any kind of hard data to actually prove this hypey hypothesis that standing tables are, going to change the way you work. Um, in, in reality, it's it depends on how you use it and it might help you, you know, while you're standing, it might help you um, get moving on some tasks where you have to execute, but maybe for more creative tasks, it's better to be able to sit down and sit back and just kind of ponder. Uh, so that that's the kind of the, the gist of the outcome. But the result was that we had realized and stumbled upon this concept and this approach of taking the data uh, that we already had that was generated by our users that we owned uh, and packing it into a newsworthy aspect. And so this article was published on ReadWrite Web, which was at that time a very hot uh, IT tech platform and publicity. So we started taking this method and replicating it right, left, and center. We tried the same thing, but uh, working on a yoga ball when working on yoga balls started becoming trendy. Um, most recently, we're still doing it. Most recently, my co-founder um, found, uh, or we had found several uh, TikTok productivity hacks <laughs> and put them to the test using this, uh, this data. Um, but hands down, our most successful campaign was uh, one that we used uh, a wide variety of our um, user data. Uh, what we did is we isolated the top 10 most, uh, most productive people using desk time and, and just scanned through to see if we could find something that they had in common. I had a few hypotheses. For example, maybe, uh, maybe they start working like super, super early, like 5 a.m. club type thing, or maybe they start working super late or, and, you know, more in line with circadian rhythms and that sort of thing. 
um, that was all debunked. But one thing I did find was that they all, what they all had in common was that they work on average in 52 minute sprints and then break for uh, 17 minutes away from the computer and then come back for another 52 minute sprint. So uh, we published this data uh, and even still, if you Google 5217, then you will get troves of articles. Uh, there's a Wikipedia page all about this research that I had essentially conducted uh, using just our software user data. That's amazing. And it um, really. How many how many users were involved when you like? Are we talking twenty thousand or more? Like, is that what you're? I'm not going to remember the figures um, off the top of my head. Uh, we do have several articles on them on the Desktime website, uh, as well as probably news sites uh, along around the internet. Um, but it was if it was the top 10% of desk times users at that time, which was, I don't know, it's about seven years ago now, uh, then, uh, yeah, and then that's probably somewhere in like the 20 to 40K area. But I don't quote me on that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because we, we've talked about something similar in the past called Pomodoros. And Ryan has implemented that. And it, it, the interesting part to me is that pe people are naturally kind of doing that, you know, 50 minute sprints, then taking a break and coming back to another. And I, I've noticed that I kind of do that myself as well. But it seems like I, I've, I've got about 40 minutes in me of just solid focus and then I got to take a break. And then I gotta exactly. Come, come and there's so much science and data to support it that uh, people can only focus and and have you know deep work time for a certain amount of time before they need to give their mind a little bit of a rest they need to get away from the computer and then when they come back and they can get back into it at the same level of intensity and what we also found was that um, by by giving yourself these breaks you can also continue working for a longer period of time whereas if you're forcing yourself to be working for you know just sitting at your desk from you know morning to lunch and then from lunch to the end of the with the work day uh, I mean you're going to be burnt out around 3 p.m and just like sick of it <laughs> uh, but if you've been forcing yourself to take these breaks um, then there's just more energy to continue and this was one of our major successes and and uh, what we what we did is we we had this data that we had aggregated and we had offered it to all of the major sites so fast company inc venture beat all of these mashable they all said no or they ignored us or whatever and then uh, you know dejected we uh, kind of lowered our expectations and uh went for a maybe less well-known less uh i don't know uh, a website that didn't have as much traffic or renown as some of the other ones that I mentioned. Um, and we landed on the Daily Muse, which is Career's website, and, uh, and they were happy to publish it. And it turns out that they have a deal with Mashable. And the next day after it was published on the Muse, we saw our article on the front page of Mashable. And then from there, it just got republished into every single one of the news outlets that had rejected me the previous week. Okay. Uh, so oh. uh, there's some beautiful irony in there and, uh, and just keeping, keep trying and keep pitching and eventually you'll, you'll get there. Yeah. I love that. Um, hey, so I wonder, could we talk about, so, I mean, in you guys' case, you, you obviously had a, the software platform that you'd created already and you were collecting data, you know, steady on everybody who uses the platform. But for most people, or like a lot of people you might consult with, smaller businesses and things like that, maybe they don't have this kind of data. Can you talk about maybe some places where people could dig to try and, I, yeah. I guess, sort of put together a news story based on maybe limited data that they might have collected? For sure. And the beauty about this is that every, at least every software product is going to be sitting on a database of their user behavior. So even if you're not, if, even if it's not a productivity tool uh, or something like that, you still have information about how users are using your service. And uh, based on, on what that area is, I'm confident that there's always an angle that you can find that will be interesting to a wider audience, maybe not like the whole world, but certainly maybe in your niche. So for example, when I was working at Printful, 
then um, we decided to replicate this process. And there's uh, one thing that um, the industry loves, or like the retail industry and e-commerce industries, uh, they love original statistics about um, like growth of sales from like on a year to year basis. And especially around um, like the biggest sales days of the year, which are Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all of these. And so, uh, so based on orders at Printful, and Printful has several, I mean, many, many stores that are um, hooked up to the service and, and people are buying at those stores. So it gives you a kind of broad representation about uh, e-commerce activity on these days. And uh, as a result, we were, uh, we were quick to um, get our programmers and data scientists to pull out um, statistics. Uh, we did the math, figured out how much percentage of growth, more purchases uh, you can expect uh, on you know, Black Friday versus a non-Black Friday. And, uh, and then there you go, you've got original industry data that is very sought after by many people because there are tons of people who are writing articles and, and uh, they need original statistics. So if you're, that's, that's, that's one way. Okay. And, um, so as and yeah, and there are different, different uh, ways to go about that. So like, even if you have like some kind of other software, uh, you can see like, you know, how effective, uh, I don't know, you have maybe several products. You can, you can tell them over the course of time um, how one kind of product category has grown in popularity over time. Um, and you can find out uh, and you can do the math and you know, figure out the percentage of, of growth for that product. And then you can craft a piece around that. There are so many options and any, any software product is going to have this database. Uh, so it's just thinking about, okay, what might people theoretically be interested in? What kind of data are we collecting and how can we package that to be newsworthy? Okay, so you started to say, or you did say a couple examples of the types of information that these media groups like, you know, for example, original information about sales growth and things like that. Are there other examples of the types of stories or the types of news or the types of information that are most attractive to these different media platforms? Yeah, so original data is an incredible direction to go in and and if you can find your original data and create your own original data points and that's already incredible um, you might not always have occasions for that so for example with printful you know there's the black friday cyber monday and holiday season but you know they might not have that same kind of interest uh you know mid-june uh for example but then there are other things that you can do um in the meantime and uh, one of those things is um publishing and coming up with provocative opinions, having sharing your hot takes on, on topics. Um, so for example, one of my earliest success pieces uh, was um, sharing the opinion that infographics are dead. And this was at a time when everyone was making infographics. The infographic was the hot thing to do. But, you know, coming out and saying, no, nope, they're dead. There's a, you know, there's a new kid in town. Um, and this was because we had built also for desk time. It was uh, at that time, it was super, super cool. It was a, a landing page where you scroll through the website and, and then you'd have like the different data and statistics fly in and it was animated and that kind of thing. So it was kind of like an advanced web infographic. Uh, so, you know, the hot take was that infographics are dead. And here are a few examples of uh, next level like infographics. Uh, and so that was very, very well picked up. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and if it, like you can have that kind of hot take about your industry or that goes against popular opinion, uh, then that's one option that you can pitch to media. And uh, if it's within your industry, then that's a way to generate buzz and rec uh, recognizability, recognition and uh, product rec recognition, brand recognition um, across the web. How, so, how I mean, important is the uh, the pitch to media versus just hey we got a blog we we've written these articles uh, and let nature do its course and hope that people come and visit your site that yeah, pitch I'm, to media it seems like it's the the next step to actually getting eyes on your article yeah there are different uh, approaches and 
and and there's plenty to be said about both. So, for example, uh, we had um, we had a piece. Uh, we had done some research on the impact on music, on productivity. Uh, we had le- listened to different genres within our entire team, tracked our uh, collective performance, uh, and con- compared which genre made us work better <laughs> and what and and whatnot. Um, and we pitched it around to to several media outlets, and no one really picked it up. Uh, and um, we decided to publish it on the blog. Uh, so, you know, it, it's our own readership. And yeah, we have plenty of blog readers as well. Um, uh, but, you know, it's not it's not the same as, you know, getting in front of this these massive audiences. But a curious thing happened uh, that it started becoming referenced by journalists that were writing articles on music and and the the impact of music on on productivity because we were one of the few places that had that original data. So if you have some really great original data, I mean, ideally I would say, yeah, try and pitch it out. Uh, but if, if that's not an option, then it's also not the end of the world. And, um, and by having it on your website and of course doing everything you can to, to you know, uh, make it visible, you know, the search engine optimization stuff, sharing on social media uh, and that kind of thing, sharing on forums, um, it helps helps get that word out, um, but yeah, I'm, the pitch is very important, uh, and it's a key aspect. And writing a successful pitch email to a media outlet is an art in and of itself, and something that we've spent I've spent my entire career uh, perfecting and and developing. And you know, one one approach doesn't work for every journalist and uh, there are also differences in who you're pitching and and what you offer them so for example uh, there are a website or a news site will likely have an editor who's at the top and they decide what articles get published or not then there are journalists who are underneath them and they're the ones that actually write the pieces uh, but they have to clear the topics with the editor Um, meanwhile yeah so uh, if there's a case where you want to write the article yourself, then you would go to the editor, not to the journalist, because the journalist wants to be doing the, the writing themselves. So if you've got a ready-made article, you can go to the editor. If you only have a press release, you can go to a journalist. And so there are differences, differences in that. Um, also, yeah, giving, giving the reasons why this topic is relevant, particularly right now, uh, it helps journalists have like the ammo to go and clear it with their editors. Meanwhile, you know, if the editor sees that, you know, the stuff is good, then, you know, it's, it's easy for them to just clear the way for your content. So the, the approaches there are also different. Okay, so I wanted to ask you, you just touched on something that I think might be kind of interesting. That is, you know, choosing topics, right? So we talked before about the kinds of information that that these big publications like to pick up, original data and that kind of thing. But is there a way to sort of, I guess, read the tea leaves for what's hot at any given moment? So it seems to me that by the time you see something pop up on, you know, your favorite news aggregator or whatever, you know, like that hot item has maybe already happened. Is there a way to sort of stay up on the trends and understand what's next so that you could be sort of positioning your data to fit that need? Yeah, well, this is really where personal expertise comes into play and keeping up with what's relevant in your industry so that you are the one that can approach these media outlets and say, hey, listen, I know this topic and I know that like this is going down. This isn't the way we do it anymore. Something like that. Or uh, if, if you see, uh, it's a, a lot of serendipity. So for example, with the trendy with the trendy uh, office gadgets, the, the standing desks, the yoga balls, all of this stuff. It's kind of just observing the hype and thinking, okay, can I add to it? Is there any way that I can add to this conversation? The conversation is already happening. Uh, can I jump in on it? And the thing is, when there is a hot topic, uh, journalists and editors and news sites, they are interested in publishing as much as they can, can about that certain topic if people are interested in reading it. So if you can offer content that relates to this, this trendy topic in a timely way at the right time, then editors will be super interested in taking up that offer. So one example is uh, we were writing, working with an e-commerce platform called Selfie, 
Um, and uh, this was at the time when SoundCloud was going through possible bankruptcy processes. And it was kind of like any day now, it's just going to go under. And then people were worrying about what's going to happen to their music and their playlists and all this stuff. Uh, and what was interesting is that we, th- through working with Cellfi, they have uh, an integration with Cellfi. It's possible for them to uh, kind of, you can put your sales widget into your Cellfi account or into your SoundCloud account. And so on the Cellfi end, we, you could see from which platforms most purchases were coming. And what was surprising to us was that the most purchases were coming in from SoundCloud. So we saw that there was buying intent on SoundCloud, but SoundCloud itself didn't have the option to buy an album or you know, buy the merch or buy uh, the record or whatever it is. And that, that could have been a major revenue option for them. And, you know, if they're going through these bankruptcy processes, then, man, setting up some kind of e-commerce functionality, that you know, that can go a long way. You know, they actually, they still haven't done that. They, they don't have the e-commerce set up. They've got ads now. Like, so if you, as someone who puts music on SoundCloud, if I send someone a link to it, they have to sit through an ad to listen to what I'm trying to send. And it's, it's like even their little widgets now, if I embed it on my personal website, you've got like, go to our site, go to our site. It's like very, like, I'm very, I'm very turned off by SoundCloud. Yeah, and I see, almost that's, wish there that's was a missed, thing. that's a missed opportunity. And so we wrote an article, uh, an opinion piece on, uh, this is SoundCloud's last chance to monetize its service. And we have the data to back it up that this, this will work. And so, uh, I think it was VentureBeat that took that article. They were super interested in it um, because everyone was writing about SoundCloud. No one knew what was going to happen. And we were able to provide something new that no one else could offer to that, to that conversation. And that's complete luck that we had in conversation with Selfie. Uh, you know, we asked them, okay, well, what are you guys seeing? What's, what's new? And just through informal conversation, this came up. And, and at that time, you know, there wasn't this SoundCloud crisis but you know a few weeks later there was and we're like oh well we've got something to say about that yeah Yeah, no i love that that's a a really cool circumstance and uh yeah i mean it just goes to show the power of data i suppose um i wondered if we could uh sort of shift gears a little bit and maybe talk a little bit about storytelling so if we've already collected data and we've already landed on maybe some topics that we think are of value of course a big part of all this is is communicating that stuff in a compelling way and so I wonder if you wouldn't talk a little bit about just sort of the storytelling process and how we go about, you know, packaging and compiling our data in a way that's interesting to broad market uh, platforms. Yeah, so that's such a wide topic. And I'm wondering, where, where do I even begin? <laughs> um, and I find that uh, when trying to convey information, the most successful approach is being um, upfront as soon as possible, like immediately telling them, this is what we found. And then, uh, because people who read online these days have the attention span of a goldfish. And in fact, I think there was statistics and data that showed that uh, our internet attention span is actually less than the goldfish's attention (laughs) span these days. Um, So you don't really have a lot of time. So you've got your headline, and then essentially in your first sentence, I usually try to tell tell the reader what the gist of our findings are. And then you have the rest of the article to expand on that. Um, But being upfront, so you've got your headline that claims one thing, your intro that lays down, we did the study, we found this, and you know, the outcome was that. Why is that? And then you can go into, okay, uh, you can talk about um, what it means. Uh, I mean, methodology is always super important, especially when you're um, presenting any kinds of data or studies or whatnot. Um, I've found that you don't need to have a huge data set. You don't need to have like academic levels of um, data analysis. Uh, It's enough to observe a trend. And, and offer it at the angle that makes sense for you and that story. Um, because this isn't a peer reviewed paper. This is, you know, the impact of uh, TikTok trends on productivity, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, that, that, that would be my tip being as front as upfront as possible. And then going into the details afterwards, being, being transparent with the methodology, being transparent with uh, the size of the data set, um, outlining why this is relevant. Uh, and I also love adding steps that people can take or, or how, how this news can be actionable to someone. So for example, if we're talking about the 52-17 work break ratio, then we might end with different methods on um, how to implement it in your own life, uh, how to set it up, uh, what kind of timers to use, what to do on your breaks, what the best way is to take the break. Uh, give them a few uh, examples about what they can do during that break. Get up, uh, take a walk, go to the water cooler, make yourself a coffee, um, take a stroll around your building, that kind of thing. Um, I also wanted to ask you, just as it pertains to storytelling, about your take on sort of some of these new AI platforms and the importance of working with a professional writer versus just, you know, either doing it yourself or using one of these platforms to do writing. I think that there's such a, an importance out there for good, you know, good uh, content these days, considering there's so much clickbait out there and everything else. But I wonder, you know, it, it's becoming easier and easier to generate content in an automated way, but it's also sort of cheapening the content. And so I wonder if you wouldn't talk about just the, the benefits of using a professional writer and somebody with some expertise versus maybe one of these platforms. Yeah, so I think that this majorly depends on what kind of content you're creating and what outcome you're hoping to achieve with that. So uh, personally, my approach to content marketing is always reader first, so to be as helpful as possible to the reader. There are different content marketers that say, uh, no, content is for search engine optimization, uh, and as a result, maybe the article isn't super helpful, but it does get them ranked because they've got the right keywords and the right headlines and, that, and whatnot. Uh, I do believe that Google eventually will become smart enough to differentiate the two. Um, and so that, that this will be a winning strategy in the long run anyway. But uh, when it comes to these uh, kind of semi-automatic copywriting uh, tools, I've found that Sometimes they're helpful. Some, they're helpful for search engine optimization articles that might have a very uh, defined structure, might have very predictable um, sentence structures, uh, you know, headlines, paragraphs, conclusions, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but if you're looking to provide really helpful original information, then the AI isn't going to figure that out for you, uh, especially if that's, that topic is something that's new. So if, if this is really helpful, then it's likely because someone else hasn't written about that yet or hasn't uh, written as in-depth about it. Um, so the, the machine can't fill in those blanks because those blanks have never been filled before. They have nothing to learn from. Um, so maybe consider who you're writing for and for what reason. Um, and, uh, and and go from there. And but uh, in terms of uh, PR, what I found interesting is there was a list of uh, careers that are most likely to be replaced by robots in the next whatever fifty to hundred years, whatever the time span was, and uh, and then also the flip. Uh, the career is least likely to be replaced by robots. And I found it very interesting that at the top of the list was PR because the approach to PR is so unpredictable uh, based on, and we talked about, you know, spotting the trends. Like there's no easy method. There's no algorithm to finding it. It's just observing what's happening and trying to like bring, like make those connections, uh, which is a highly creative um, and unpredictable process and requires a lot of empathy and it requires a lot of sensitivity and, and understanding how different outlets work, how different people work, how they prefer to be pitched and whatnot. Um, that uh, apparently some professionals had decided that uh, robots and AI is not yet in a position to make those calls yet. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, in every engagement I've had with PR agencies and things like that over the years, 
I mean, what makes a PR agency valuable tends to be the relationships, the, the people they know, you know, who do they have on their list, you know, this kind of thing, because I mean, you know, as far as the writing goes or whatever, you can hire a copywriter, you can do that kind of thing. But if you really want to shop this article around, you do need the expertise of people. Right. And, and I think nowadays I imagine more than ever, you know, these big media publications are bombarded with requests from, you know, amateur writers and professional writers and robots and email campaigns and, and everything. And so to break through, you almost do need that human touch still. Yeah, absolutely. So I noticed, uh, on your uh, LinkedIn profile, uh, you used to work for a company called uh, Content Labs, and the, the slogan for that was full stack content marketing. And I actually thought that was pretty creative and, and cool, uh, just based, you know, come, coming from de- uh, development, full stack is front end, back end kind of thing with Content Labs. It almost sounds like data with results, you know, like the articles. So I, I kind of just wanted to bring that up and see if that was kind of like your, your mindset with that, where you were working in a tech field, full stack market. It just kind of, I liked it. So yeah, I, you know. <laughs> yeah, I really like uh, your interpretation of it. And, and it's definitely, uh, I mean, the terminology probably did have come some, it, it's my own company uh, that I had created uh, before okay. establishing True Six, which I uh, established with the co-founder. Content Labs was my own personal gig um, before going all in uh, with my co-founder. And um, yeah, and so, you know, the full stack marketing was definitely the a concept that was that's borrowed from the tech industry, um, but it has also become prevalent in the marketing world to describe different different kinds of marketing aspects Um, because, you know, we've got content marketing, you've got uh, digital uh, marketing, you've got advertising, you've got pay-per-click, you've got uh, social media marketing, you have all these different approaches. And so. uh, Yeah. 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 I like it. I just wanted to highlight that because it was cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I love it. Um, next thing I wanted to sort of touch on is sort of, you know, we, we've gone sort of a little bit through a process here, right? We've talked about the types of data, we've talked about the sorts of topics, and we've talked about the importance of storytelling and copywriting. But now that we've done all those things, where do we put this stuff? So can we talk a little bit about the differences between sort of, I guess, social media marketing and broad market marketing through publications? Yeah, so there are always different options for your content. And there's this one rule of thumb. Uh, that for however long it took you to create your one piece of content, you should spend twice as much time distributing it because it's not enough just to write the stuff or create the stuff. It used to be uh, the the thought that you know if you if you build it, if you write it, the people will come. Uh, it might have been true at one point, but it certainly isn't true anymore. Uh, and one of the keys to to successful content marketing is actually you know do, putting the work in to make sure that people see it and. There are these two different approaches. There's uh, the work you can do on your own owned channels. And then there's also the work you can do on external channel- channels. And having a, a mesh, uh, the combination of the two is probably the best way to go and uh, making use of as many, as many channels as you can. And of course that depends on the kind of content that we're talking about at that given time. But if we're talking about, so for example, the uh, original data articles that we were talking about uh, earlier on, then uh, you know first you have to source the data. Uh, you'll probably talk to your programmers about that, and they'll give you an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Uh, and then you you know go through it and you figure out what the trend is, what you're seeing, and then you have to write it out. Uh, if you're approaching a media outlet, then you have to present that data to them in some way. And the most efficient and most uh, accepted format in the industry is to present it via press release. So writing that up, writing up your uh, outcomes, your methodology, your data set, um, and like the whatever impact and background, uh, that all goes into your press release. And then you can present that to the journalists. uh, Or if you want to write it up yourself, you can go to the editor. In this case, I would go with the journalists because you can get uh, more bang for your buck when you write a piece uh, yourself, then uh, it's likely to be picked up by one um, media outlet. Whereas 
if you go with a press release and you have a piece of news, then any outlet can pick up that piece of news. Uh, but they're not interested in republishing opinion pieces that have been published elsewhere because they're competitors with the other media outlets. So is there like a, a one-stop shop to submit your press release kind of thing? Or do you have to kind of over time there find are those tools. contacts? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there are tools for that. Um, personally, I've never seen much success from uh, press release distribution platforms. Um I find that they they guarantee an absurd number of pickups, like you know, over a hundred media outlets will publish your press release. But it seems to be that they're kind of like automated. So they just like automatically they have some kind of deal with whatever outlet. In fact, I think they also own a lot of them, like they made a, a ton of them just so that they would have somewhere to put those press releases and a lot of them aren't indexed on Google because you know they're considered spammy, understandably. Um, so the, the higher success rate and definitely the more difficult route is creating your media list and approaching journalists one by one, uh, checking out what they write about, what they have written about and figuring out if that's a topic that they're interested in and then offering it to them. Um, as a piece for them to cover. So are you like going, reading an article on finance, seeing who wrote that article, finding them on LinkedIn, sending a connect request, sending them a link to, Hey, this is the article I wrote. And then going from there, or is it like a hit up the newspaper directly and say, Hey, can you forward this to your, your journalist? Yeah. So so there are different options here, but uh, the key in most cases is finding their email address. And sometimes there are media outlets that have their journalists' email addresses listed, for example, TechCrunch. Uh, But um, then there are others where it's not listed on the website. But uh, very often, journalists will have their email addresses in their Twitter bios. A lot of journalists, tech journalists, use uh, Twitter uh, actively, and uh, and sometimes it's not listed there either. So then you, it's a, it's an entire process. There's a lot of googling involved. There are also different methods of, about how you can find email addresses. If you Google those methods, then I'm sure you'll find uh, these different approaches described. Uh, but yeah, and so I've, what I've done uh, with my team at True Six is just over the years we just have these databases of journalists the topics they write about and their email addresses uh, and and uh, any comments about what kind of previous interaction we've had. And so that when we have a story come up about a certain topic, then we can go back to our list and see, okay, such and such writes about these kinds of things. I'm going to check out what, what they've been writing recently. If they're still writing about this kind of stuff, they might be interested in this uh, and then reach out to them personally and say, hi, Susan. We were in touch a few years ago. We've got a new story for you. Or if we weren't in touch a few years ago, then it's, uh, you know, I've, I see that you write about, you know, these topics and we have some new insights in the industry. Here they are. Let me know if you're interested or if you need any additional info. Um, but one thing that's also very helpful is having that data published on your own website as well. So uh, having your own article that's published on a blog or something like that, um, which is, similar but different to to the press release uh, so that when people can people ask uh, or they need something to link back to so for example I don't know that desk time desk time's original data states that you know xyz um, they will likely want to link to the original source um, for legitimacy purposes so you have to make sure that you have a source for them to link to so not only are you creating a press release not only are you creating uh, a media list but you're also creating content to publish on your own site which is also helpful from you know a plethora of other reasons you know the fact that you're coming up with cool stuff uh, you want to you want to have some of the the goodness uh, for your own website and domain authority and all that stuff how important is the the digital aspect of things. So you've got, you know, your, your article written, how important is the YouTube video to go with it or the podcast to go with it? Does that add to the element or does that not really help in regards to uh, SEO or anything like that? In terms of creating your own podcast and your own YouTube video or approaching other podcasters? 
I guess in terms of just distributing the content you're trying to put out, does the, so you, you've got this article you just wrote about, does a supplementing podcast and, or supplementing video help get that out to the world? Or is it more the, the media, uh, you know, getting it in front of like TechCrunch? Is that, mm-hmm. you, you know, like you're on our podcast for a reason. So, I mean, like there's obviously an element to it. So it's just kind of, I'm, I'm kind of curious if you've noticed a trend as far as like what does better, the, the videos versus the article or the article or the video. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the content itself and the medium and whatnot. And of course, in when you're considering this an outreach campaign, the more different channels, the better. If, if you have your own YouTube channel, if you have your own podcast, yeah, write about that there, publish it there. If they are just uh, treating external podcasts or YouTube channels uh, as media outlets, just the same as you would uh, with the written uh, news platforms. I mean, that's super relevant and it might be more relevant depending on the industry you're in. If your product is, uh, I don't know, influencer marketing based, then you might be wanting to go that direction, the, you know, the YouTube podcast, uh, social media direction rather than TechCrunch. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's about finding your audience. And so figuring out where your audience is hanging out. Uh, and, uh, and once you know where their eyeballs are going, then it's your job to try and get in front of those eyeballs, regardless of where they might be. Um, I wanted to try and kind of pile on Mike's uh, question there and, and ask just uh, maybe a little bit differently. How important is exclusivity? Like, is it like if, if we publish this article on our own, let's say our firm comes up with this data and we decide to run out this article on its own, then at some point in the near future or whatever, we decide to shop it around or maybe we do it at the same time. Does our publishing of that piece take away from other publishers' ability to use that data or does it make the, the story less interesting to other people? So exclusivity is a really cool card to have at the very beginning. So you can figure out, okay, what's the coolest website that I would love to have pick up this story and contact them and offer them exclusivity that, you know, you you will be the first and the only ones um, that we're going to talk to uh, about when this news goes live. So if our news goes live next Thursday at 9 a.m., then you are getting, uh, like, you will have sole information about this until that evening when we send it out to everyone else so by them being able to be the first to publish it's uh you know you have to consider media as any other business they're interested in serving their customers better being better than their competitors uh, and having more interesting content for people to come to and visit and click so if you think about how can I help them achieve those goals, then one of those ways is to make sure that the, the, the data first is uh, available there. So, um, so that's, that's exclusivity is one option. And another option that's also really helpful is embargo uh, information data. And this is um, something that we made use of uh, last summer when we updated the 5217 findings uh, because, you know, it's a... a uh, study that's seven years old, and we were wondering if that th- those facts and figures that those numbers have changed, for example, after two years of a pandemic, uh, and they had indeed changed. And so, we contacted the journalists who had written about our story the first time around, and gave them um, access before. And so an embargo is when you uh, give a, a journalist a story, but tell them that they it can't be published until a certain date and time. Um, so so their, their journalistic inte- integrity doesn't let them break a story faster. Uh, and then at that whatever certain date and time, you send it out to the larger masses. But ha- sending that information a week earlier gives them time to conduct uh, their own interviews, conduct their own research, craft things the way they want to. Uh, And then they can also be among the first to break the news. And yeah, and this worked out really well for us. And it landed us um, a piece in Inc., which was then shared and republished uh, through different uh, formats uh, into different media as well afterwards. So just a a quick follow on to that, and and maybe you you can just sort of elaborate on a little further. But 
from a SEO perspective or a, a I, I don't know, becoming known as the source of truth or something, is there any real um, benefit to being first? Like, so, I mean, if, if you do go out and you do, you know, run this out exclusively on some platform, but then a week later, all that data becomes available to everybody else. Like, was there a benefit to that original publisher in being first? Yeah, it depends on the scale of the news. So, uh, it, essentially, it, like, if it's big enough news, that means that the traffic's traffic is going to stream to their website first you know if the topic is that interesting that it's like super hot and it's a matter of hours that you know drives drives these viewers to their website then it's totally uh, interesting so for example in the case of uh, Printful uh, when they raised their funding round I think it was in the fall of this past year I might be mistaken um, and uh, and their valuation um meant that they became Latvia's first unicorn. I mean, that was a really big deal for the entire country of Latvia, as well as you know, a, a big story in the Baltics and in Europe in general. Uh, and they had an exclusivity deal with um, uh, a platform, Wall Street Journal, I want to say. Uh, and only later was the press release sent out to additional uh, media outlets. But so for, you know, a good chunk of time that was the only place to read about this big news and uh and then you know other media outlets that weren't waiting for the press release were using that source and also linking back to that source um as proof that this has happened okay nice cool no i think i think that's really helpful so um we're kind of getting to that time we got a few more minutes left can you maybe tell us where people can reach out and find you and then um Tell us a little bit about Latvia. Are you from there initially, or did you relocate there? I noticed that you had written an article about um, relocating to Latvia, and and it's kind of it's interesting to me because it, it seems almost like it's an up and coming tech place that that's trying yeah. to get more tech people there. So. Yeah, I'm originally born and raised in Canada, and I've been living in Latvia for the past 14 years, uh, and I'm half Latvian by descent, so that's that's why Latvia. And yeah, this the tech sector is growing at an unprecedented rate, uh, and the the rate of investment in Latvian startups in the past year has just been exponential, and and it looks like this next year, this coming year, is also going to, you know, keep up on par. And Latvia is part of the Baltics, the three Baltic countries: Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and altogether they are just such a hot hub right now for startup growth. And it's uh, really exciting to be here, and a lot of innovation is coming out of here. And um, what's also really exciting is that. Uh, because they're small countries, they can be really agile in terms of regulation. So there's a lot of national regulation uh, that's being put in place to specifically support, for example, startups or, or fintechs or, or whatnot. Um, and uh, thanks to this, for example, Latvia uh, was named the most startup friendly country in the world last year um, wow. because of a combination of these different regulations, the last of which was um uh, making it possible to give stock options to employees. Nice, very cool. Yeah, and they're I think coming out with something. a they're coming out with a digital nomad visa soon. So anyone who wants to come over to Latvia, the more the merrier. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was going to say. Actually, I spent a lot of time working in the remote workspace, and uh, and these uh, digital nomad visas are popping up all over. But yeah, I don't know exactly the terms of the Latvian one. But I, you know, in the case of a lot of them, there's a lot of tax advantages and you know, discounts and, you know, I mean, it's a way to go explore a foreign country and do good work uh, that you enjoy and, you know, experience it in another country. And in some cases, you know, actually maybe make a little more money because you're not paying taxes on that money or whatever. The, the yeah. And the great thing about uh, the Baltic countries is, uh, you know, they're part of the European Union. So if you have a visa for one country, you have a visa for everywhere in Europe, nice. which is pretty sweet. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, yeah. So Julia, just to sort of wrap up, let's let's tell people where they can find out more about you, learn about your businesses and, and how to get in touch with you specifically if they'd like to uh, engage. Yeah. So uh, you can check out my company, True6, true6.co. Uh, also the same on Twitter. Uh, I personally on Twitter, I'm at Julia Gifford, J-U-L-I-J-A-G-I-F-F-O-R-D. And definitely check out DeskTime desktime.com, uh, especially if you're a kind of productivity hacking kind of person um, and you can do all kinds of cool productivity studies on your own. 
Cool. And we'll put all those links down below. And True Six, just for everybody listening, is true and the and the word six. So T R U E S I X dot C O. And uh, so do check that out. And uh, thanks so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a lovely conversation. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. And we'll see you guys next time.